and we'll stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. <clears throat> Uh, welcome everybody to the November 16th Board of Health meeting. Um, let's uh, just immediately start with just reviewing the September meeting minutes. Um, f uh, since with last meeting, I had inadvertently not sent them to all the members. Uh, had anybody looked over the minutes that had any issues or concerns? No. Um, and motion to approve the September minutes? Approved. Okay, that's one. Any seconds? I second it. Okay. Any? Uh, all voting for approving the September minutes, say aye. aye. Any no's? No. Okay, they are submitted. Um, Linda, did we have um, minutes from the October meeting? Did you send them to me and I just forgot to send them again to everyone? I was wondering about that when I was looking them over today. Okay. Um, did I forward them to you? Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 I apologize. It's okay. We'll we'll I'll get it for next month again. The same All right, thing. Let me we'll just go do the look. Double. No problem. So we'll do the double. We'll do the October November minutes in the next meeting, please. Okay. So we will move on to the health officer's report, please, Mr. Teltoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the November 16th uh, Board of Health meeting. Um, on the inspection reports, we did, we did 21 food safety inspections, eight bathing places, and we had five quality of life issues. A couple with uh, dog bites to humans. We had two of those. One sewage backup in a uh, food facility and a concern of, of moisture infiltration, which is mold, um, and one complaint of mice. Um, just wanted to point out that we have a few new restaurants coming to, or either here in Radnor Township. The Big A restaurant, which is we're going to be at 810 Glenbrook Avenue, it used to be Pasilio's. It's coming soon. Little Basil Restaurant, it's going to be a new Asian restaurant at 906 Conestoga Road. Autograph Brazier, I always pronounce that wrong, 503 East Lancaster Avenue, which is where George's used to be. First Watch Restaurant, it's going to be down in the area where um, the old Villanova Diner was down in that area. And the second one is going to be a Starbucks down there. So ends my report. Uh, just a couple of follow-up questions from last week, or last month, rather, Larry, if you could um, share with us. Uh, I believe the Yang Ming has opened. Is that correct? Y Yang Ming has opened, and um, about, two, about a week ago, I popped in for a visit, which was my intent to pop in probably once every two to three weeks just to see how things are going. Um, now that they have my attention, they're going to get a lot of it. Um, we did have another restaurant this week that um, on, a, on a much smaller scale, but however, we did have to do a correction there, which was um, Matador on North Wayne Avenue. Um, they're back open again. And also a follow-up from last month is the are, are the are the legal aspects of the Yang Ming case settled in in the Delaware County Courts yet? I uh, two three of the four summary citations that I've written are are resolved. I do have a hearing next month on one of them. Um, I got an email this month from another board member who couldn't be here tonight, and she had a question concerning. Um, uh, fines or other things, or actually, I think more of a concern about um, is there a, a payment to the township for reinspection when things go wrong on a, on a repeat inspection? Is there some kind of fee that's paid for that extra inspection? And I didn't know if there's any information about that that you can share with us. The township code allows for a fee to be set. I believe the amount is two-thirds the amount of the license fee for any inspection over the second follow-up. I believe that's correct. Thank you. 
Um, we'll move into some old business. Um, I'm not sure if we mentioned last month. Can I ask okay, a sorry, question? Sure. Oh, please, please. Um, when we spoke at our last meeting, I believe you had reiterated, or maybe it was our September meeting, different ways that township residents could let you know of issues they're seeing in restaurants, and you mentioned there was the website and an email address. Has, has anyone in the public um, mentioned anything to you? Has any has anything come about of that? Um, on a routine basis, I get calls about various restaurants. In fact, this week I got, not this week, but Friday I got one regarding a McDonald's they thought was in our, our jurisdiction, but it wasn't. But on a routine basis I get calls. The problem with it is I have to check them all out. And many times there are disgruntled employee who's mad because they got corrected on, on their job or just got discharged for some reason. So well, unfortunately, they take up a lot of your time, but you have to do it to make sure that they don't have any merit to them. But again, I, I encourage people to, to call me if they have issues that they're um, concerned about at 610-688-5600, extension 148, or my email address at L-T-A-L-T-O-A-N at R-A-D-N-O-R. Dot org. Any other questions for Mr. Altone before I move on? Yes, so mm -hmm. I was curious about the re, um, moving forward. We identified that it's a lot of work for you and where we were with that in terms of maybe getting some extra help or dividing up the work for inspections of schools and um, restaurants in the township. So I'm wondering where we are with that. I do know that the manager and, and my supervisor are, are definitely talking about it and because it's budget time I think it's rolled into that process so I don't look for any relief honestly before the end of the year but you know we've survived so far I think we'll do okay till the beginning of the year no, oops, I'm sorry I'm gonna reach out to mr. Rosenkowski for the December meeting to give us an update to be in three months after the uh, initial episodes um, so we'll move into some old business and just real quick uh, last month if anybody didn't hear the mission statement was approved and it has been posted to the website according to an email from Larry um, so we will we have that um, uh, interesting article found this month uh, uh, speaking of old business about doggy dining laws um, the state of New York um, out of Albany this past month October 27th approved statewide for um, pets to be in, um, allowed to be in outdoor dining areas um, so we had a, a resident here of, uh, last year who was concerned of, uh, about uh, maybe doing that in Renner Township, and I think that this kind of gives people a, a bit of a, a, a something to stand on if they write letters to their representatives to get the state laws changed in Pennsylvania to possibly uh, for us to enjoy the same privileges. Um, we had spoken for many months about scheduling health presentations, and thank you, Dr. Capuzzi, for doing one today. Um, and I was just trying to see if anybody had an, any interest in the December meeting. Amy, were you, your Dr. Leader, thinking about it? You know, I'm happy to do one. I'm, I'm blanking on what the topic would be. <laughs> I almost feel like if we collectively came up with a list of things we think the public might want to hear about, we could sort of divvy them out by expertise. You know, I'm happy to talk at any time, but I'm really blanking on what that could be. We'll put our thoughts to it, and if we can't figure something else out, I'm sure I can figure out something to talk about a bit during December as well. So we'll speak about that during emails this month, if we don't mind, everybody. Um, we have a, a subcommittee that needs to be formed. Uh, we also spoke of this last month, and we need some volunteers to work with, possibly with Dr. Humphrey, um, concerning artificial uh, turf uh, safety. There have been numerous reports on NBC News that I've been specifically reading um, concerning uh, safety of, of, uh, as of these artificial turfs that are made with tire um, beads or tire rubber beads. Um, there has been no, f as far as I can tell so far, but I think the subcommittee can look through this a little bit further, no real new information in the past five or so years since this has last been uh, looked at by the um, Board of Health and by the EAC in Radnor Township. Um, but uh, however, there may be some more information out there that I just have not found, and that's where our subcommittee will hopefully give some recommendations to the EAC and to the Board of Commissioners concerning artificial turf. We have a number of fields in our community, and I think it's a, a worthwhile effort to re-examine that issue. We got the Yangming update from Larry, thank you. And 
uh, Dr. Leader, if you don't mind uh, helping us with our another intern that's uh, come in today. Yes, um, I'd like to introduce you to Neil. And maybe, Neil, you might want to say a few words about yourself and what you're doing at Radnor and why you are excited to be with us this year. Oh, uh, I'm Neil Chen. Um, I'm a sophomore at Radnor High School, and um, I'm very interested in health and management, so administration. Um, so I'm excited about this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Neil. And you'll be working, hopefully, with uh, some of our board members to figure out a nice uh, health project to do for the season. Uh, we look forward to hearing your ideas, everybody. And, um, and our other intern is, is it Amelia. We'll be happy to hear from you guys uh, in the next couple of meetings about what your ideas might be. Um, and if, by the way, if you have any issues, concerns, questions for any of the board members, please feel free to talk to us at any point. We're here for you guys uh, as well. We can move into some new business. Um, I think we'll start, we'll kind of switch things around a bit. Uh, via email over the last month, the board has been discussing um, changing meeting times um, to a later time. And I believe the majority of people who got back to me were uh, up for changing the time to 5.30 p.m. instead of five o'clock to get some of us here a little bit more easily. Uh, I spoke with um, Mr. Taltone about that this month, and because of the late time that I got to him, it was unable, we weren't able to change this month, but starting in December, I think it would be nice if we moved to 5.30, so all of us have a better opportunity to get here. Um, however, there is one other issue for next month, and it was about the meeting date. Um, next month's meeting date is scheduled currently for December, er, get my calendar here. 21st, right, which is the week of Christmas and the holidays beginning and all of the craziness for everyone starting, I'm sure. So I wanted to see if there was any uh, thoughts on if we could get it to the 14th to make it 530 on the 14th. Is anybody um, in favor of that? Anybody not in favor of that? Sounds good to you guys. So since we have a majority here, um, I, I'd actually like to just quickly vote on that if possible. Is there something going on that night possibly? Oh, there is? Okay. There's a, there's a board commission meeting on the 14th at 6.30. 6.30, okay. So we can... You can meet at 5 reasonable. What's that again? You could meet at 5 yeah. if you like. Yeah, okay. I think we reasonable. We've been, we've been getting things done pretty rapidly, so I think if that would be okay with everybody, is there any... What's that again? I, yeah. So another, another big point of having this meeting at 5.30 rather than 5 o'clock was that we don't seem to find any of the community who wants to come out, I guess, that early. Well, hopefully 5.30, maybe we can get some people here. There's a board of commissioners meeting that night. Maybe people will be here for that. So maybe they'll ask us some questions and, and, and share, some of their, uh, share some of their thoughts with us. So that would be nice. So let's plan on the board meeting being December 14th at 5.30 p.m. Let's just check with our interns, too. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. So for Neil and Amelia, if we move it up a week for just December, is that OK with your school schedule? Could you come the, the Monday the 14th instead of the 21st? OK, OK. I do appreciate that. So that'll keep our families, uh, hopefully, uh, more organized for the holidays. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and uh, so we'll move on to a presentation today on um, zoonosis, which means, uh, I guess, animal infections. Is that what that means? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. So zoonoses um, are, are what I consider for me, the most interesting aspect of, of veterinary medicine, and I'll, I'll tell you what it is um, in a minute. So there's something that all of these animals have in common. Actually, there are a few things, but you know, possum, deer, raccoon, groundhog, fox, chipmunk, dog. Does anybody know why I chose labs? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> they are cute, and they are nice, and they, I think, are the official mascot of Radnor Township. I, I don't think you're allowed to live in Radnor Township unless you own a lab. That, that's my theory. Um, skunk, cattle, we've got black Angus um, in the township, beautiful black Angus. Uh, squirrels, this is the gray squirrel. Mice, moles, does everybody know what this is? Vole, they destroy yards. 
Um, but they're cute. And cats. So what all these animals have in common, one of the things that they have in common is they, they can all be found to a great degree in Radnor Township. And they all transmit disease. Um, where is my, um, okay. So one of the interesting things about Radnor Township and the, and the Tri-County area, which is right here, is that we have a plethora of, of waterways. And this is, this is Delaware County. This is Radnor Township. And I think this is the mouth of Darby Creek. A school school comes up here, and then I think these are the branches of Darby Creek. But we've got a whole lot of water in this area. And where there's water, there's life, lots of animals, and there's disease. Um, the definition of a zoonosis is a disease that's naturally transmitted from animals to people, either directly, um, such as in the case of salmonella, or through a vector, such as in the case of Lyme disease with a tick vector. Bartonella is the first thing I'll talk about. Bartonella, bartonellosis is cat scratch fever. It's caused by the bacteria Bartonella hensilae and it's transmitted by um, cat scratches and bites. So the cats are infected with this, uh, the, excuse me, the fleas and the ticks are infected. They carry Bartonella, and the cats will you know, bite at the fleas or the ticks or scratch, and then they scratch a person and then in infect the person. It's actually a, a pretty yucky illness. Um, fever, um, bacterial, angiomatosis, uh, vascular inflammation. And it's mainly a problem for the immunocompromised, for the elderly um, and otherwise immunocompromised. Strep throat. Does anybody think strep throat can <laughs> be transmitted or harbored by dogs? It, it, it actually can. And, and of all the crazy theories that people come up with, uh, when they come into the office, and there are really some out there theories. I've heard several times um, people come in and tell me, oh, my daughter's had strep throat so many times, and I wonder if the dog's giving it, giving it to, you know. And, and initially, before I, before I knew about this, when I first got out of school, I was like, no, your dog's not giving it to, to your, your child. But it actually can be harbored in the dog, in, in the saliva, and then the, the dog, you know, licks their coat, and then you pet the dog, and then you touch your mouth. So, so they are a, uh, a reservoir. So this would be an example, a group A strep, a reverse zoonosis. It, it typically doesn't sicken the dog, but it can be uh, a reservoir for uh, making it difficult for, um, for strep uh, to completely be eradicated in a household. Um, and it is debatable. I'd be curious uh, as, as to what, what you think as a pediatrician. Um, Campylobacter. Campylobacter is uh, disgusting. It's, it's a bacteria, fecal oral transmission, um, harbored in a poultry, undercooked meat, undercooked poultry. Birds, reptiles, farm animals also carry it. And, and it's very important to have kids wash their hands, uh, you know, when they're around puppies and kittens because they can have overgrowths of Campylobacter that can be transmitted. Um, it causes abdominal cramps, diarrhea, and it's also implicated in the um, serious neurologic disease Guillain-Barre. Salmonella, salmonellosis, we all know what that is. It's a gram-negative anaerobe. Um, uh, from the feces of any animal, and it also causes what what is known as songbird fever in cats. They the cat eats the bird, the bird's infected with it with the salmonella, and then the cat gets sick. Uh, and you've all heard of the about the painted turtle ban in the 1970s because. I mean, I guess the thought was that little kids are putting these turtles in their mouths, but, but I, I think it's really they were touching the turtles and then putting their hands in their mouth. Um, the two types, Salmonella and Teridides, uh, from undercooked meats, uh, undercooked, un undercooked eggs, 
And I want to emphasize mass production. Salmonella is a normal um, bacteria in all chickens and all birds. When it when it when you get an overgrowth is when birds are in a very very stressed condition. So which most um, most hatcheries are. I mean, they kind of cram these chickens into cages. The chickens are pulling each other's feathers out. They're very stressed, and they get these overgrowths of salmonella. Now, the eggs, fortunately, are blasted with formaldehyde. So <laughs> instead of getting salmonella, you're getting formaldehyde, which is a carcinogen. So <laughs> it's maybe the lesser of two evils. But, but I, I do think that um, Obviously, that chicken farming, you know, backyard chicken farming is, is a good thing. But also, if you buy in grocery stores, it's better to buy the f free range chicken eggs because um, the chickens are less stressed and less full of disease because of that. Salmonella typhimorium, undercooked meat. 4% um, of US meat is contaminated, is thought to be contaminated with salmonella. Um, and it's also implicated in food poisoning, 6% of human GI effect infections and, you know, restaurant food poisonings. flu light sim symptoms, diarrhea. Tularemia um, is, is uh, fran caused by bacteria, Francisella tularensis, rabbit fever, primarily transmitted. The reservoir is rabbits and rodents. Um, there is a tick vector, so it can be transmitted by, uh, the, I believe it's the Lone Star tick. Um, also by contaminated water, aerosolized, and abrasions. So, you know, you're digging around in the shed, you get a cut, there was a rabbit in there um, that was infected. Th that's a potential. But there have been outbreaks associated with lawn mowing, believe it or not. In Martha's Vineyard in 2000, there was one f fatality. It's not very common. It's just sort of interesting. Hikers in Colorado. Um, 2006, six out of 14 in infected rabbits were found in a Philadelphia park, I, I assume maybe Fairmount Park. Um, and it's also considered one of the, um, one of the uh, bac bacteria um, pathogens for uh, bioterrorism, because it is ver potentially very serious. Uh, cryptosporidiosis is, now we're getting into the protozoal um, diseases. It's a protozoan, cryptosporidium parvum. It causes diarrhea, more serious and immunocompromised, waterborne oocysts from infected feces. So we've got water running through the township, and the animals go to the bathroom in the water or, or anywhere. And so obviously, what this guy's doing, probably, it, it's nice, it's a nice idea, but it's probably not a good one. <laughs> um, so um, harbored by people, dogs, cats, ru ruminants, deer, mice. Leptospirosis, this is a bad one. Um, it's caused by the spirochete bacteria, Leptospira interrogans. It's highly contagious um, from animals to people or, or between people. Transmission via open wounds and mucous membrane contact with infected urine. Um, it causes kidney and liver disease. Uh, 10 to 15 percent mortality. So it's it's serious and it's carried um, easily in water. Uh, rodents are the primary vector to to dogs. Dogs are vaccinated for leptospirosis. It's an optional vaccine, but I do always recommend that everybody vaccinates, whether the dog is you know some vets say you know, if your dog is a hunting dog. Um, but I pretty much tell everybody to do it because there are mice everywhere, there are rats everywhere, there are squirrels, chipmunks everywhere. Um, in, in the city, in the suburbs, uh, you can't avoid it. And there are five, the five most common serovars are in the um, leptospirosis vaccine that we give to dogs. And it's uh, thought to be pretty effective, but it's very serious. G G Giardia, um, intestinal infection, vomiting diarrhea. It's caused by the protozo protozoan Giardia lamblia. Um, there are different, different varieties, different assemblages that infect dogs and people. And this is the Giardia. It's kind of teardrop shaped. Um, 
not all of the forms are infectious to people. The zoonotic potential, potential is debatable, but not a good idea to drink, again, from um, streams and lakes because they could be contaminate, contaminated with animal feces. Toxoplasmosis, this is a, this is a horrible thing. Toxoplasmosis gondii is a protozoan. It's considered um, mainly a risk to pregnant women, but anyone who's immunocompromised and can potentially cause problems in, in absolutely anybody. Uh, it, it goes from rodents to cats to people. So if you have a cat, your cat can, can, um, can bring it in the house by uh, eating, by you know, killing rodents. Uh, cat feces is infective after 24 hours, so if, if people are changing their litter box every day, it's, it's really a non-issue um, for contracting it via changing the litter box. Half of cats in the U.S. are positive. They only shed the oocysts for like two weeks of their life. So, you know, even if they are positive, they're probably not going to ever be able to, to contaminate because they shed once and it's for about two weeks and then they're done and then they're no longer a risk, even if they at one time did have, did contract toxo. But the main cause, and, and cats are really uh, blamed, but the main cause is undercooked meat. In 60% of cases, the way people get it is from eating undercooked meat. And about 10% of Americans are positive for toxoplasmosis. So at some time in their life, they were exposed to it, and it may or may not have, have caused uh, sequelae. You have to cook meat well. If you're worried about your cat, keep your cat inside, keep the mice out. Um, ticks, there are five ticks in Pennsylvania. The brown dog tick, the American dog tick, the lone star tick, the groundhog tick, which we don't need to worry about, and the deer tick. Um, four of them can potentially um, go after people, but mainly it's the, the, the deer tick that does. So the American dog tick, dermacenter variabilis, um, it will, uh, will attach to any animal people, causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever tularemia. And this is an interesting thing to learn if you're looking at ticks. Everybody should really know how to identify these ticks. The, um, the, the shoulder plate of the, of the American dog tick is white. If you look at the Lone Star tick, it has like a white point and it's Amblyoma americanum, it's slightly rounder. Any animal people, again, Rocky Mountain spotted fever tularemia, this is in Pennsylvania, most people haven't seen it. There, there aren't that many of these, it's not one of the more prevalent ones. These are very prevalent, and I think one of the main ones in this area that you're gonna pull off your dog is the brown dog tick. It's just all one color, there's no um, shoulder plate. It's Rippy, Rippy cephalus sanguineus, and it can attach to any animals and people, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and Ehrlichia. Um, and, and, and this is a big kennel tick as well. So I, I work at a, um, at a practice that has a, a greyhound adoption program. We get greyhounds up from Alabama and Florida and they are full of these. And the reason, and it's so bizarre because they're only kenneled indoors, they never, ever see the grass, and they're full of these. So for some reason, I, they live in kennels. I, I don't know why, but they also live outdoors. Um, the deer tick, which we all love, everyone's obsessed with. This is the Ixodi tick. It has a black plate, and it's called the black-legged tick. Um, most important take-home point, this is Lyme disease. It's not Lyme's disease. Everyone talks about Lyme's disease. It drives me crazy. It was discovered in 1975 in Old Lyme, Connecticut, which is how it got its name. In Pennsylvania, there were 6,400 cases in 2014. We've been the number one Lyme disease state um, since 2008. Lyme disease is caused by the spirochete bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, and 
Um, there is no, you know, sometimes I get asked, well, you know, isn't it, if it's a small, tiny tick, it's a Lyme tick. Not true. Every type of tick has a nymph size, you know, the babies, and an adult. And so it can be the size of a pin, you know, pinhead in, this, in the case of nymph, nymphs, or the adults can be like the size of a watermelon seed. Um, all stages will attach to people. I, I think the ones that are most likely to transmit are the nymphs because in order for it to be transmitted, the, well, the bacteria goes, travels from the stomach to the salivary gland, and it doesn't make that trip until the tick is actively attached and sucking blood. So the tick has to be sucking blood for 48 to 72 hours. That's, that's two to three days. That can be missed with a nymph. So these nymphs are so tiny that the tick might not be noticed for that full three days. And then now at this point, the, the bacteria has been transmitted. Cannot test for it till three weeks minimum before you get a true positive. And, um, and everybody knows what Lyme disease causes. Usually flu-like symptoms, sometimes joint swelling, sometimes fever, sometimes nothing. And then in, in severe cases, um, neurologic and, and heart issues, but in very severe cases. Antibiotics, uh, tetracyclines for three to four weeks typically does, does the trick for both dogs and for people. Mange, here, this is another thing that can go from animals to people. This is, look at this poor guy. This is a red fox, and he has mange. Um, it's caused by the Sarcoptes scabii mite. It invades the hair follicles. Very contagious. Um, and um, and, and it, we see it in, in cats and dogs. Not that often, but we see it. Um, it's very itchy, and it's contracted through direct contact and also fomites. Um, I have heard of situations of people getting it from lawn like lawn furniture that maybe, you know, like a fox or, or raccoons have been jumping around on. So fomites are, you know, pieces of furniture or inanimate objects that can harbor something and transmit it. Um, so dogs and cats can become infected from wild animals, not even necessarily from direct contact, just from touching things that they've touched. Um, roundworms, Toxicara, Canis and cat, cat eye. Um, all puppies and kittens virtually are born with roundworms. They get them through nursing. Uh, human infection is a fecal oral from two week old larvated feces. So always important to wash your hands with, when touching puppies and kittens. Usually adult animals, adult cats and dogs don't have roundworm. Um, and clinical signs can vary from none to diarrhea. The scary thing, there can be visceral larval migraines and ocular larval migraines, not very common, but not something that you want traveling through your body and also infecting your eyes. Hookworm, ankylostoma caninum and ankylostoma brasiliens. Um, uh, one affects dogs and people, the other dogs, cats, people. Transmission is through ingestion, causes GI. Um, Hookworms have hooks. They have three sets of hooks, and they attach to the gut. And, and so um, infected dogs and people can get bloody diarrhea. Main route that people get it, and this is really scary, is it penetrates the skin, and it can cause cutaneous larval migraines. So kids in sandboxes. Hookworms more common in the south, but we do see it up here. But kids playing around in sandboxes, and then the cat cat goes to the bathroom in the sandbox, raccoons, this, that, and then it penetrates directly through the skin. It causes tracks in the skin and then can go into their organs. Um, most common in tropical areas, but seen in Pennsylvania. Tapeworm, isn't this cool? <laughs> um, this is the uh, sucker. There's a te technical name for it that I can't remember, but. <laughs> um, Diplidium caninum and the Tinea species. Okay, so diplidium is in dogs and cats, and dogs and cats that have tapeworm also virtually always have fleas. So the fleas have the tapeworm eggs. The dog bites, you know, is itching, bites the flea, ingests it, and then the egg then continues its 
its uh, life cycle in in the dog's gut. Um, Tinea is actually pretty dangerous. Um, it's acquired from meat of infected rodents, and it can be transmitted to people. Bayless ascaris. Okay. I really put this in because it's interesting. <laughs> it's very rare, and it completely freaks me out. This is one of the scariest things a person can get next to rabies. Uh, we have raccoons all over, and it's a wonderful thing, but there is one risk about raccoons. Um, Bayless ascaris procyonis is the raccoon roundworm, and if contracted, it causes um, the larvae migrate through the respiratory tract into the nervous system, and it kills half of the people it infects. Um, the eggs persist in the environment for a long time. Raccoon latrines. So what a ra raccoon latrine is, is basically a raccoon toilet. They go to the bathroom in the same spot. Fortunately, it's not right near where po most people live, but it can be under sheds. It can be, you know, near homes. And so anybody who, you know, has raccoons that are sort of nesting and have an area where it looks like they've been defecating, this is a big risk. Um, dogs can be the definitive host, which means they can harbor the roundworms. They don't get sick, um, but they can transmit it to people. It's very rare. There have only been 13 cases in 1980. This is not a big risk. Um, there have been cases in Pennsylvania, and because it's so dangerous, it is also one of the things that security people are looking at um, for, you know, for bioterrorism risks. Cattle, I only put this in because we have cattle. None of these are, are really big risks, but cattle can cause brucellosis, um, flu-like symptoms, occupational exposure via contact with infected milk, meat. It is reportable to the CDC and these cattle are vaccinated for it. Uh, Coxiella or Q fever is caused by the bacteria Coxiella burnetti, and it causes flu-like um, symptoms. It's transmitted via contact with urine, feces, milk, and amniotic fluid, or direct transmission. Um, it's rare, and again, this is also something that is uh, as can be associated with bioterrorism. It's one of the. It's on the list of things that are a concern. Um, e. coli 0157, everyone's heard about these outbreaks. There have been 30 outbreaks since 1982, mostly associated with, I think, like country fairs near where there are cattle farms. And um, it's a, a sugar-like toxin. It is reportable. And it's, it's not very common. But when you have an outbreak, a lot of people get sick. And, and some people have died from it. Rabies. 2015, there have been so far 43 cases in um, Delaware County, Montgomery County, and Chester County, and nine cases so far in Radnor Township. The Tri-County area accounts for about 15% of the cases in the state of Pennsylvania, which is a disproportionately high amount of cases. It's caused by the uh, ELISA virus, which is a type of rhabdovirus. It can affect any warm-blooded animal from, you know, from, I, I suppose maybe a whale. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I've never, never heard of a, a case in a whale, but that's warm-blooded. But any warm-blooded uh, animal from, you know, from cattle to mice. Um, there are species-specific strains, but they can all affect each other. So the bat rabies can, a, a bat can bite a raccoon, and the raccoon can get bat rabies. A, a, a dog can get raccoon rabies. Um, the canine variant of rabies has actually been eradicated, but obviously dogs, cats can get, ra can get any type of rabies, and, and so can people. Um, Pennsylvania rabies law, dogs that, if a dog bites a person and the dog or cat or any animal is having, um, uh, has unknown vaccination status or is showing neurologic signs, it has to be quarantined for 10 days because the virus is only in the saliva for the last 10 days of the animal, actually the last five days, but they add in five days as a cushion. But so 
potentially the last 10 days of the animal's life. So if they've observed that that animal is, 10, is alive 10 days after um, the bite, scratch, exposure to the person, then they consider that person to be safe and, and, um, and not in danger of getting, getting rabies. So that's the quarantine lot. Now, for an animal that has a bite of unknown origin, whether or not it came in contact with a person, that animal has to be quarantined for six months. And that can be an at-home quarantine where the animal is not allowed to run free. And the reason for the six months is that rabies manifests itself any time from two weeks to six or seven months. So if the animal's gotten through that six, seven month period, then it's considered to truly not have rabies. But for the purpose of their exposure to a person, um, it's a 10-day quarantine. Vaccination is by state. Some states require it every one year, some every two years, some every three years. Pennsylvania, the minimum is every three years. Um, rat, okay, so one of the reasons why the, this area is, has so many rabies cases is, is thought to be that this is a very proactive area for testing, um, there are lots of vets in this area, and also um, there are, is lots of county and township support for you know getting the animals, sending the head off, and so it's not owner responsibility. Um, so Radnor Township and Montgomery County are considered the most proactive parts of the state for testing, and, and perhaps that's why there are so many cases that are diagnosed in this area. Um, lymphocytic choreomeningitis. Um, uh, uh, Mice, mus musculus, which is the field mouse. It's a virus transmitted via inhalation of dried feces in the urine and saliva. And, and Larry, you had asked me about the, the situation with the, the mole um, with a residence um, air conditioner. This, this is a potential risk, not a big risk, but a potential risk. Um, it, so 5% of mice are infected. 5% of Americans have contracted lymphocytic choreomeningitis. Um, and again, symptoms can range from nothing to encephalitis. I mean, it can be very dangerous. Um, important to keep mice out of the house. Um, and West Nile virus, this is the last one. It's caused by a flavivirus. Um, there was an outbreak in Algeria in 1994, and from there, uh, these uh, these mosquitoes made their way through Europe and then uh, and then here. So the vector is mosquitoes. The reservoir is birds, particularly passerines. So those are like pigeons, doves, um, that um, bird group. Any animal can harbor it, harbor it, but only certain animals can transmit it because they don't get the virus levels necessary for transmission. Birds get high virus levels, so the mosquitoes bite the birds and then bite the person. 80% um, of cases have no symptoms, and then they range from no symptoms to fever, and then less than 1% of, of people get serious signs like neurologic disease. Pennsylvania is the number 11 state in 2015. Um, so far, there are 30 cases in people. And the obvious answer is mosquito control. Um, again, it's a lesser of two evils issue because mosquito control means, means chemicals, and then no chemicals means a potential for West Nile virus, so pick your poison. Um, oh, wait, I'm sorry, we had one more. Avian influenza, um, not a real issue in, uh, in this area. The, it, uh, in 1987, birds, uh, farm birds in Asia um, experienced an outbreak. Millions of them died or were killed. 1997 came the switch. The virus mutated, the H5N1 virus mutated from to be transmissible between birds and humans. It shouldn't say TM, um, it's, not, it's transmission. Anyway, in Hong Kong. Since then, over 350 people um, have died of it in 12 countries in Asia, Europe, and Africa. It is not in the U.S. Um, the concern would be 
you know, if birds are somehow, if infected birds are somehow illegally brought here um, from an area where it's endemic, or if in, in those areas um, there's a mutation that allows for human-to-human -human transmission, then that would be a big, big problem, because then you don't need birds to come to different countries. You just need infected people to come from different countries. But right now, it can't be transmitted between, human, between humans, and so hopefully it will not mutate. Um, so I guess the, the, the take-home lesson is that despite all this stuff, animals are good, despite all the risks. Um, John Muir, who was the found, uh, founded the Sierra Club, Sierra Club um, said, any glimpse into the life of an animal quickens our own and makes it so much the larger and better in every way. So, and um, this, this might be a plug for <laughs> backyard chickens, or it might not, I don't know. Um, Animals are good for people, but we need to be educated and use common sense to avoid letting them sicken us. Okay. Any questions? Thanks so much for that. Sure. Yeah. I have just a couple of little quick comments. Maybe you can comment yeah. on these. Um, so a lot of what we see, in, at least in pediatrics, is diarrheal illnesses from um, either Giardia cryptosporidium or from Salmonella, Shigella, um, you know, E. coli and different things. So I think the bottom line when we talk about humans, especially in children, is more than five to seven days of diarrheal illness and certainly anybody with bloody diarrhea, blood in their diarrhea should be seen by a physician for culture. So that's something that we talk about a lot. I'm not sure if that, uh, if on your side of the, of the fence you <laughs> test for that based upon that. I don't know if you, like for animals I'm saying, for testing for, for them when you have a, a sick animal that, that could be transmitting, but I'm, I, it, mostly in humans, that they are diarrheal illnesses that we that we treat a lot of, and also okay. we uh, tell parents a lot of times if your child is exposed to stool in the environment, so if they're outside playing in a sandbox, horseshoe pits, etc., and they're exposed to stool, we do ask them to uh, contact us. We have treated a few kids um, prophylactically for Ascaris um, after speaking with the infectious disease specialist at CHOP. Uh, when we're not sure if this was raccoon feces oh, the child okay. was playing with. Uh -huh. So there have been a couple of preemptive treatments, although we've never had a positive case that okay. I, at least I know of, and I don't think the infectious disease doctor is known of any in the area as well. And the other thing that you mentioned too is 6,400 cases of, of Lyme in Pennsylvania has got to be a, an extraordinarily low number. Um, at least in, in pediatrics, we treat a lot of preemptive Lyme disease based upon just the rash. Uh, the state it is required that you're supposed to report your cases of Lyme. However, I think a lot of times we over-treat, uh, so we're pretty much unclear about how many cases there are. And the state is informed whenever someone gets a positive lab for Lyme disease, and that's I think, goes into the count. So I would say 70% of kids that we treat for Lyme disease never get a lab drawn because we're treating them based upon the rash. Right, right, right. So I would suggest there's probably many more. Yeah. And again, back to our you know, tick avoidance and, and good, uh, you know, good watching of your skin is really important for that, of course. Okay. I really appreciate all the information there, Jenna. It's good sure. stuff. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kabuzi. I also have a question. Yeah. So um, working in the healthcare environment, particularly in the emergency department, we have people coming in all the time for exposure to bats and wanting a rabies vaccine. So would you be able to shed some light on when would be considered an exposure, hence the rabies vaccine series? It is quite a number of shots, and I don't know if the public really understands how many days are involved and how many different shots. So when would you recommend coming in or for exposure for I people mean, to know? You know, I, I obviously can't get involved in that. And, uh, you know, as far as, you know, people do sometimes ask me questions about recommendations for them with certain exposures. And I say, oh, talk to, <laughs> defer to your doctor. Um, but, but my, my feeling from what I understand about the virus would be anybody who has any potential exposure to bats where they've been sleeping and may not know if they were bitten because they've got such teeny tiny teeth and they might not know, um, or if they had close enough exposure where they could have you know, inhalation. I mean, there has been, have been rare cases of inhalation via aerosolized, um, you know, saliva. So situations like that, yeah, I mean, they should definitely go to the emergency room. And then I think, I don't think the rabies law addresses 
Pennsylvania Rabies Law addresses what the doctor should do. I think it's up to their medical discretion, but my understanding is that most emergency room doctors, the, the you know, standard of care is any potential exposure, you just, you just do it. And, um, and that it used to be, you know, the eight painful shots in the stomach, and now it's, I'm not sure if it's two or three, I, I believe it's just two, like in, in the arm. Is it, is it, is it four? Okay. All right. It used to be five. Okay. Um, and I don't know why it's not in the stomach anymore or why it was in the stomach before, but, um, you know, it, it's funny because when I, when I was a kid and, and my father was a doctor, we had, we caught a bat, my brother and I, that was in our house and he gave us, my dad gave us a butterfly net to catch this thing. And, and so we were in the basement by ourselves, like playing around, catching this bat. And then we, we caught the bat and then we put it in a cage. We basically spent the entire afternoon like taunting the bat. And, and I'm thinking like, what was my father <laughs> thinking? We were lucky to be alive. We should have, you know, by, by standards today, we should have been in the emergency room like the second we even saw that bat. Um, but anyway. So the transmission is more theoretical, but when it's something that's, you know, 100% um, fatal, I, I don't know. What, what's your feeling in terms of, do you think the... We just, uh, there's a shortage, of course, of rabies vaccine, and we'll have whole family members coming in wanting to be vaccinated. Oh. So that's where we're coming from. Oh, so. wow. Okay. Yeah, the county health department in, in Chester County um, often gets these phone calls, and almost universally, what you said is exactly right. You know, if you're if any risk of exposure possibly from a bat in your house when you're sleeping, they're asking these people to get their rabies vaccinations done either at their primary care office or in the ER. So it is a, like you said, 100% fatal disease. Uh, you know, a lot of caution is the most important thing, but it's difficult. We're having difficulty in our office getting rabies vaccine as well. It's a hard one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we are running out of time for a next, the next meeting in this room, so I will get to the announcements quickly. Uh, last month, we had mentioned this um, Villanova lecture series called the Naratel Family Health and Human Values Lecture Series. And this November 17th, tomorrow at 5.30 p.m., is a lecture on nursing ethics. So, it, Excuse me, it, that's a misprint or something. Oh, it's 7.30. 7.30. In the, in the Conley Center. Oh, got it. And the, uh, the, it isn't just for nurses, it's mm -hmm. health care. Uh, Cindy Rush, Cinda Rushton from Johns Hopkins is a nurse, but she's PhD ethicist as well. And with her will be uh, Margaret Garrett, who's a Villanova nursing alumna, and she is the general counsel for Johns Hopkins. She's also an attorney. So the two of them are going to be with us tomorrow night. Wonderful. <coughs> Sounds like a good series of lectures. Um, since there's no public participation, we will adjourn this meeting of the Board of Health for November 16th. Thank you for uh, watching on television and thank you folks for attending today. We will be here December 14th now uh, at 5.30 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>